All right, thanks so much for your patience. Um, so for our final session for the afternoon, uh, I'm pleased to announce that Josh Gwyther, who is the global uh, generative AI lead at Google, is going to be talking to us today. So let's give a big hand for Josh. And hosting, and hosting Josh is going to be Yunhei Li, uh, IDM student at MIT, as well as a co-president of the MIT AI and ML Club. Let's give a big round of applause for her, too. Hello. Awesome. So it's been a great day of conference so far. And we've soaked in all the creative energy from the past few sessions. The presentations have been amazing. And now we're really happy to have Josh here to close up the conference. And we hope that this discussion will be a great closure um, where you can take away a lot of the learnings that you learned from since the morning today. So Josh, um, well, actually, before, I want to give a little bit more introduction about you. Um, so Josh is the Global Generative AI Lead at Google Cloud. He has been one of the core members of Google Cloud um, for over seven, eight years. Um, yeah, and, and his work really focuses on empowering companies with the latest AI developments, um, including startups and enterprises. So welcome, Josh. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for everybody holding on all day. Um, hopefully, you have a, we'll have a good heated conversation here in a little bit. Great. OK, so to kick off, I would love to ask you about how you got started in this field. Yeah, and, and, and I've, we've been talking, I've been talking those last couple days as, since I've gotten here, and I can definitely talk for a long time on generative AI, so I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but I'm happy to, to converse with everybody afterwards as well. Um, so I've been in technology for a long time. I'm going to date myself. Uh, started in the early dot-com days, um, so over 28 years. Specifically at, at Google, um, you know, one of the, the best things about working at Google is seeing some very early technology very early on. Uh, so when I first came to Google, it was before Google Cloud was being was established as a, as a business. So that was part of what I was there for very early on is to build out what Google Cloud is today. Um, and then I ran our startup and digital native program for the West for about four and a half to five years, right around there. And as you can imagine, you know, most of that was in Silicon Valley. Um, so lots of, lots of advanced, but lots of fast moving companies. And it was probably about two and a half years ago now um, that it, obviously I have friends across Google and one of my colleagues in Google Brain sent me a link, a Go link. If, if, if any of you have worked at Google or know Google, these are our internal links for different systems. Um, and it was to a model called MENA. This was very early days. It was, I think it was slightly less than a billion parameter large language model. And again, this was two and a half years ago. Um, and I clicked on the Go link, started interacting with the model, and immediately kind of had that same epiphany moment that for, again, I'm aging myself, but it reminded me of showing people the internet in 1994. That first time you saw that document come up online and, the, and you could immediately f project, wow, this is gonna change everything. And so working with that large, that large foundational model two and a half years ago, what really struck me was um, that for all of you, I'm sure you probably, you've probably you've worked with or had an Alexa or a Google Home at some point. You probably still do. Siri, one of those uh, smart assistants. And in, and in the back of your mind, you're always doing that context switch when you're actually trying to interact with that, that device. What I mean by it, you know what you want out of those assistants, but you have to say it in a certain way so that it understands what you want to get that response. And what blew me away from these models wasn't the, wasn't the corpus of information that it knew. What blew me away is I quickly realized I wasn't doing that contextual switch. That I was actually just typing and conversing with this model like I would a human, and it wasn't messing up. It wasn't missing the context. And that's what really got me excited is that, oh, we had, we'd figured out natural language processing at a human level, and that changes the whole paradigm of how we interact with computer systems. Um, it's, we're still in early days. I mean, this was two and a half years ago, but we're still in early days of that. But that was immediately where I saw the interfaces of tomorrow going away, a whole new paradigm of how we interact with computers. So long story short, but that 
that ended me into taking a 20% project with Google Brain on figuring out how we surface this as two third parties through Google Cloud. Um, and then in 2022, I moved into our office of the CTO working specifically on code completion with large language models. So if you can imagine, be, this was before ChatGTP and the whole explosion in the space, but one of the first things we looked at at Google from a productivity standpoint was code completion because we've got a lot of engineers at Google that write a lot of code, so any efficiency we could find in helping them code was something worthwhile going after. So I was working on that project when ChatGTP hit in, uh, in November and then uh, moved into this role in early 2023 uh, to try to figure out what our go-to-market strategy would be for third-party Google Cloud, how we bring this to the masses that you've all seen over the last year. Um, and now uh, we're also, I'm also building out a new organization of generative AI rapid prototype developers to help work through some of the use cases that our customers are bringing to us. Great, thank you for that. So throughout your career at Google, you worked really closely with startups as well as enterprises. And I would love to know what kind of early adoption trends you've seen in the field so far. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting. And when I say the early days, it kind of cracks me up because the early days of generative AI is about 18 months right now. But um, obviously the first movers to take off on this were, was the startup community. Um, and what I saw a lot of again, early days, about 18 months ago, was a lot of my founder friends in Silicon Valley were introducing generative AI features into their SaaS platform primarily. A lot of it was ad tech, you know, you know, coke or um, content creation, image creation, summarization, that type of thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very interesting how fast we as a population go from amazed to the mundane very, very quickly. <laughs> and I think a lot of those early adopters in the, in the startup community that were adding generative AI functionality, everybody was still so amazed with what this technology could do, including the, the VCs. So there was a lot of money being pumped into some of these early startups for that. Um, that I think early on, a lot of founders envisioned that this new feature, feature functionality with generative AI would mean additional SKUs, higher, you know, more revenue. They would be able to uh, charge a premium for the generative AI functionalities. Um, that market got flooded very, very quickly. And not just by other startups doing the same thing, but also platforms introducing that into the platform as functionality itself. So. Um, not really Google, but think about you know OpenAI, some of the functionality, and also as more and more people got access to these tools, a lot of what was being built, most people that were using these tools could just do it themselves manually. It wasn't it wasn't a heavy lift for them to go into an assistant, a, a generative AI assistant, and say, hey, summarize this for me, or they didn't need to pay a SaaS provider to do that. So you know, very early on, I think that was part of the lesson learned was that this stuff is going to iterate so fast and it's going to be integrated into the daily lives of so many users, you really have to differentiate on some new unique function. Otherwise, the core platforms are going to have this functionality very quickly as well. Now, most of those, most of those early startups that I worked with are, are still around and still progressing, but they've done a couple things. You know, one, um, what they found out very early on, too, is that the larger foundational models are almost a cheat code. And this is where the Fortune 500 is right now. What I mean by that is that, and you've probably all experimented with it as well, if you take a large foundational model and you prompt it elaborately, you can get it to perform some pretty amazing functionality pretty quickly. You can have an amazing prototype very fast. <laughs> I vividly remember being with our Google Ventures team watching a hackathon last year and our jaws were dropping because what people were able to hack together in three hours would have been in a whole Series A company you know, just a year ago. But what those early adopters found out very quickly is if you're, that as a startup, you go into production with that, and you may have had, you know, maybe your, your user base wasn't that large, so you weren't feeling the pain. But if you had any hit, any adoption of what you rolled out, what they came to quickly realize is that this is way overkill for the functionality that we were trying to do. That the analogy I use, it was like hiring a PhD to run the cash register that if they were doing text summarization or text completion as part of their SaaS offering, using something like Gemini Pro or GTP4 was way overkill from a, from, a, from, a, from a computational perspective. And so the industry, I mean, the startups shifted very quickly to open source. When Llama hit, that was big. When Llama 2 hit, that shifted a lot of the thought processes of, of the startup community into the new state of the art is 
how small can I get this model? And how, you know, how can I tune the smallest open source model I can find to perform this specific function? So it's at the lowest price point and the, the, the lowest inference uh, cost from a speed perspective. Um, and so that's the lesson being learned very quickly in the startup community and we're, they're iterating through that. So that's kind of what I see a lot of is that MVP with the big models, but then quickly figure out how to optimize that through open source and smaller models once you've figured out like this is the methodology you want to go towards. Um, that's also left, led into what I'm also seeing a lot of is you know, lang chain and chaining uh, multiple functions uh, across LMs. You can also do some pretty complex work workflows, but there's a cost to time. So you know, you, you chain too many functions together. All of a sudden, that request on your SaaS platform takes a minute versus 15 seconds, and what's the user tolerance for that? So there's a lot of effort going into reducing inference time um, in chaining model functions together as well. Um, now on the startup side, it's interesting because that's they're, they're not quite yet, or I mean on the Fortune 500 side, it's very different. Um, they're still understanding what generative AI can do. They're not yet filling the pain point of rolling this into production at scale. So they're still squarely focused a lot on the large foundational models and using just prompting techniques because again, you know, where, where startups have the luxury where the Fortune 500 doesn't is usually an engineering talent. Um, and, and especially in this cutting edge space. So a lot of times for a Fortune 500 to get something up and running very quickly, they're gonna use a really big foundational model with just prompting. They might not have the skill sets to do um, some of the tuning mechanisms needed on open source yet. They're building that skill set up, but they might not have it immediately. So as they're going through that maturity cycle too, some of my more advanced now Fortune 500 are coming to that exact same conclusion. That probably the future, and this is where we're heading as a company too, is that creating a, what we call a mixture of experts, or think of it as a routing layer on top of, the, of a multitude of models that perform certain functions at the best efficiency. Um, and it's, that's really kind of where we're at from a state-of-the-art perspective between you know, what's going on with startups versus Fortune 500s. Um, startups are now, you know, it's interesting that they're pivoting much more towards vertical use cases, um, niche data sets. The model is more of just the engine to drive that and there's a lot more sophistication in choosing the model, tuning the model than there was just 18 months ago. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> Great, no, that was, that was really insightful. And actually, to jump onto that, I would love to see what kind of challenges you've seen among your clients, and could you s extract any perspective from that? Yeah, I hit on some of them, but I think you know, one of the biggest challenges is, is people. I mean, in, in the day, you know, what, what I see and when I attend sessions like this today is that we are, and this is the analogy I try to use, when you go into a Fortune 500, everybody is still, and this, I think this applies to startups, because if you have a startup in this room or you're thinking about a startup, primarily a lot of them are gonna be B2B, so you're gonna be selling to these customers, <laughs> right? So at the, at the Fortune 500 level, they're still getting their heads around all these technology jargon, RAG, embeddings, fine tuning, what does this all mean, foundational model, prompting, and just like all of us, they may have a pocket of expertise that are getting up to speed as quickly as they can on this, but they're trying to figure out how to apply this and actually have a real turn on it, a re return on investment. As what, what ultimately most of the, for the struggle they're having right now, even in the startup community is, What's real value that warrants additional revenue? Like we, we don't want to roll out new generative AI functionality just to increase our cost of sale if there's not a return on that investment to happen. Uh, and that's been the biggest struggle because the, I think the mindset has been so focused around the model itself and, and what the model can, can, can do from a data retrieval standpoint the analogy I use for a lot of my customers, and I think the right mindset to start thinking about in this is that, forget about all the technical jargon of what generative AI is. Think of this new AI as a workforce coming into your organization, because that's really what it is. If, if, and I, I pose this to a lot of my executives when we have these conversations, that forget about the technology for a second, but I could, you know, if I could give you unlimited college graduate an unlimited college graduate workforce at a fraction of the cost of what you would have to hire for today, what would you use them for? And that really starts the right mindset of how you should be looking at this technology is 
it is an artificial intelligence that, can, that has now the ramifications to work alongside with humans. And where we're at in the industry right now, if you think about it, if I'm this AI embodied as a person right now, from a foundational model perspective, if I walked out of MIT tomorrow with my, my graduate and I'm sitting in this seat and I go to work for a company, where the model's constructed right now, and this is where a lot of the confusion comes in, is I've got a really good general corpus of information. I went to college, I've lived my, I've graduated. You can ask me a, a bunch of general questions and I'm probably gonna respond really, really well. And that's the first lesson that these enterprises learn is that just a foundational model and they'll ask it specific questions to about their business and it may not know it because you didn't take any classes on that or that wasn't part of your general knowledge. And so there's some confusion and well, can we get a better model that will know all that? And it's no, what you think about it from a human construct, you haven't em empowered that new employee with the information that's specific around your business. And that's when we when I start to articulate, that's kind of where we're just at right now with generative AI is now you can augment that foundational model with a subset of information. We call it RAG. You've probably heard the terminology, but it's basically in the human construct, I'm now working for you. You've now given me the manual of the, of, of the specific information I need to answer Q&As for. And this is a lot of the implementation of generative AI. You see a lot of chatbots, and that's really what it is, is you've taken this AI that has the human potential of say a college graduate, you've given them now the manual of how to use your, project, your, your product, and you're now launching them out to answer Q&A on a myriad of different you know, chat interfaces. The next step in that, and this is where it's hard, because if, if you're limited at a workforce that has a good general knowledge and a manual, they can do some, some decent work within your organization, and you know, a college grad can definitely write you up text summarization, text completion, they can do some illustration for you, and there's some value in that. But the next step in, is, if I'm, again, in the, using this human analogy, what I really need is access to your systems. Just like if I was an employee that was working in a division of your, your workforce, if I don't have a laptop, if I don't have access to, to do anything beyond just answering questions out of this book, there's only so much return on you, using this person you're gonna get. And that's where we're exploring and going into this year is more agent actions. Uh, workflow automation. Can you can you start to now arm that AI entity with access to certain systems? Again, you have to take risk and then compliance and privacy. There's a whole other. I'm, I'm glossing over this, but from from that perspective, this is where this year is going to really start to unlock real ROI because this, if once that AI workforce can start to take action against systems like a human can. Um, it, it dramatically increases the potential. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting transition we're making over this year, for sure. Yeah, that's great. And earlier today, we had panels about the enterprise and also startups, and I think some of the points that were discussed there, you're also covering as well, so it's great to hear that. Um, yeah, and you also touched upon this a little bit, but we'd love to um, ask for your insight on what are, what are the, the next steps that we want to see in, in this field? Yeah, I think, you know, the, and I'll, I'll we have time, right? Well, we have, is that our timer right there? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm happy to stay, but we were just talking about this earlier. There's a couple things that are gonna be really interesting. Um, one is, and I'll, I'll tell a little story, and hopefully this will tie in, it's a long story, but hopefully tie into kind of the point I'm making here is that, again, think about, you know, two and a half years ago, um, I'm interacting with a model that is at the same sophistication of like a GTP 3.5, right? Um, and this is way before the layman's understood what generative AI is. And uh, this is what I love, would love about Google, is very quickly as we're playing around with this model, I don't even remember who the engineer was, but there was an engineer that wired up the LLM to a 3D avatar of Darth Vader. Does everybody know what Darth Vader is? I just want to, I don't know how international the crowd is and who's seen Star Wars, but, um, and this was a good lesson on LMs, and, and you could click this button and you would go into a Google Meets and Darth Vader was staring at you, and the whole voice, the whole nine yards, and it was talking. And of course, this, I'm now interacting with an LLM through, through speech, and I'm asking it questions about Star Wars. 
And of course, it's nailing every response. There's a ton of Star Wars information on the internet, so you can imagine the general corpus was nailing Star Wars. And then in, in my, my engineering brain in me is immediately like, I've never seen anything like this before. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna break it because I'm gonna ask it something completely out, off, you know, um, out, outside Star Wars. So I just asked it about Texas Hold'em. I just went into poker immediately. Um, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of information on the internet about poker. So it was nailing as Darth Vader how to coach me how to play Texas Hold'em. Um, and, and it's funny because you're laughing because I had the same epiphany moment that about seven or eight minutes into the conversation, I forgot about how ridiculous this whole situation was because my brain is switched to, well, I'm just free-flowing conversation and the information coming back is relevant to what I wanna hear and I was engaged in the conversation. And the reason I bring that up is that it's interesting that I've had that experience over two years ago and we're still in the area of text interaction with most of these models. Most of your all interactions have been and most of the stuff being built right now is a very text-focused, maybe even maybe a voice-to-text interaction but it still hasn't been this fully embodied, photorealistic avatar model engagement. Um, and that to me is, is interesting. And I think it's, as we progress, the surfaces are gonna progress on how we interact with this really, really quickly. And it's one of the things where I see the pieces lining up right now, meaning that experience I had with <laughs> Darth Vader two years ago, if you take the Apple Vision Pro and you create a Unity version of that, and powered by an LLM, and it can map that entity into 3D space, there's no reason why right now, if I had these goggles on, Darth Vader couldn't be sitting next to me right now in this 3D space. And so, you know, and I can, it's hard for me to, to put into words, but I, what all I can say is that as engaging as you think it is through text, wait till you're interacting with it in real time via voice embodied as an, as an entity talking back to you. It's really engaging. And so I think for me, it's really, really interesting, especially hearing a lot of talk stars today. What I'm most excited about is that most of the focus on generative AI up until this point from a business perspective, go to market, startups, it's very engineering focused, which I understand because it's the engineers that understand how to build with this stuff right away. They have the immediate understanding of what, how to construct an actual generative AI application or platform. But what's gonna be fascinating to me is when the art catches up with the engineering on this. And we saw a little bit of this in this last presentation, but what I think we were gonna see over the next year, year and a half is, is more and more of, I say layman's, but just non-computer science background individuals get into this space where the tools get more approachable it's the, the, the ideas, the surfaces this thing, these things are gonna be embedded in are gonna be so much more compelling than they are right now. Um, and it's, I, again, I, I wish all of you could have that Darth Vader experience with me because it is one of those untangibles that, wow, this is really compelling in a bunch of different ways um, that it's, we haven't, I guess, long-winded answer, we haven't seen anything yet. Like this is still very, very early days in it reminds me, I, again, I'm gonna age myself, but it reminds me of the internet. It reminds me of when images first came to HTML and that was like, whoa, and this feels like a lot of kind of what we're doing right now. Wow, we can do images with generative AI. We're not even close to figuring out this new surface and new businesses that are gonna be landing on this new surface, which is AI. So over the next you know, two or three years, I can't predict what it's gonna be, but I know myself, because I'm locked in that paradigm of you know, how things have already always been, but all of us will have those epiphany moments when we see something just, why didn't I think of that? It's so obvious. You know, some new way of looking at this technology as a medium that someone outside of the, uh, an engineer's background is immediately gonna see what, the, what, this, what, it could, what it could do or the functionality for it. That all of us that are locked in our own paradigms are just, again, you're gonna have that slap the forehead moment of like, ah, I should have thought it was so obvious. And that's what's exciting to me is I can't wait to see what some of those obvious, but I'm blinded to um, experiences that people are gonna bring to market with generative AI. That's, that's gonna, it's gonna be really fun over the next couple of years for sure. Yeah, it sounds like the Darth Vader really <laughs> captured you. 
And I think it, it's like a running theme um, where there, you know, you experience this epiphany moment. It's, I, I think we were having a conversation last night. It's like a personal Turing test when you don't realize like you're, you're being fooled. And I think um, Raleigh was actually presenting earlier. She was talking about the magical experience. Um, I think it's all related, kind of creating this perception and, and experience. So yeah, so right now um, we only have a couple minutes left. So we would love to open the floor for any questions. So if you could go up to the mic. And oh, thank you very much for your thought. Um, Darth Vader episode. <laughs> um, one question I have is, is there any way to um, quantify and record those wow effects? Because startups are incentivized when we are providing a solution to measure the market size, but those subjective or aesthetic views or um, more not measurable things are not on the data that is that so I think that creates a very hard challenge for startups to prove that what we are doing is enough value for you to invest on so I think those systems would be very helpful it's a great question and I think I don't think there's any way and again because I can't explain it to you I think and this is what's really interesting and I do a lot of work with the ventures team at Google too because you can imagine we see a lot of startups coming across um, and right now, it's it's we're almost at the point where you got you, you have to come in with a prototype. You know, I think for a lot of this, it's especially like that experience. And I I literally had a slide of this talk track, and it just it's not the same. Like I can show you a picture of Darth Vader and say it's amazing, but it did, it won't land until you've actually experienced it. So some of this stuff, and it's also what was really interesting because again we I saw it play out in 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 the zeitgeist of of our of, uh, I would say I don't like, I don't like the term layman's, but just a general population because, again, I'd been focusing on LLMs for quite some time, and I've been known around Google the guy that would not shut up about the chatbot because I was like, wow, this is incredible, this is incredible, and it wasn't until it wasn't that OpenAI did anything that we didn't have. The magic was that it put it in the hands where a, a layman's could interact with the model, and then they could experience what we were talking about. <laughs> And it really was that. I mean, we, you know, if you think about it, and most people don't even remember it, is we actually showed our foundational model at I.O. in 2020. It was when Sundar got there and talked to a paper airplane, and he talked to the planet Pluto. You probably don't even remember it, because it, it, it was magic. It really was. He was prompting the model to act like Pluto, and it was responding back like the planet Pluto. But it, to that point, until you engage with it, 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 it it didn't land. It wasn't until the general populace got access to it in a consumable format that they that opened the eyes of everybody. So I guess, again, long-winded answer is the best way is to put them in that experience instead of talking about it if you can. Right? Bootstrap as much as you can uh, to get to a point where the the pitch is not pitch is the experience, or at least as close or rough, so that they can start to get that feeling or understand what it is. I also heard before iPad um, came out, people didn't know what to do with the iPad, but once it was on the market, everyone loved it. I remember that. I remember unboxing the iPad, and I was kind of the same way. I'm like, oh, it's a big phone. I don't know what I want to do with this yet. But, <laughs> Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, for sure. Hi. Th sorry. Thank you. Um, my name's Umbreen. I'm a, a Sloan Fellow at MIT, um, Femtech founder. Um, so women were not included in clinical trials until 1993. So there's a lot of talk about, you know, fine tuning and RAG and, you know, fidelity to the knowledge base. But there's also the concept of GEICO, where, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So eight out of 10 drugs withdrawn from market with toxicity are toxic in women. So we need to, so can you sort of give me your uh, perspective on you know, building a whole new knowledge base, like particularly in women's health or medicine, is a, is a heavy lift and it takes a lot of time. Um, would that be something that would be like an important space to invest time in as a startup where you've limited funds? Or, you know, is, that, there's, is there value in that for women's health or in general? Well, it's so surreal you're asking this question. Because um, I was sitting with my wife on the couch uh, just two nights ago, and I have a five-year-old daughter, and she was sitting in between us. And my wife's going to kill me for bringing this up, so hopefully she doesn't hear this. But she was, one of her friends was going through menopause. Mm -hmm. And she brought up this exact, because she's an RN, she brought up this exact example of that 
it's crazy that there's nowhere women can go to learn about this. There's just not enough data on what it's like to go through menopause. And only one in five quit GYN are trained in menopause. Yeah, and she, I mean, I just it's again it's surreal that you're asking this question because she looked over at her daughter and like our daughter is not going to be that way. She's, she's going to know all about this. Like she's going to understand this, and we had this exact discussion. Um, and she's read a lot of books on this and the challenges of the fact that there was women were just absent from a lot of this medical data. So I absolutely think it's an amazing opportunity to go to market with. Uh, you know, my wife would be on board immediately. <laughs> like I said, it's surreal you're asking this question because we were literally just talking about it two nights ago. Great. So can I find you after? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing endeavor to go. I mean, I, I don't know even an inkling of like, you know, how would you get trials and where the data, like, there's so much work in gathering the data. The degenerative AI part is the easy part in that conversation. It's really around how do you collect reasonable data to then augment with it, but it's, you know, it's important to me personally. Like I said, it, it just came up in our family conversation. So yeah, I'd love to talk to you about it. Thank you. All right, we'll take one more question. Hello, uh, this was a great talk. I had a doubt about like uh, future data sources for like these models. For example, a lot of the data is being like sourced from the internet, but I'm assuming that there's a lot more human knowledge that's been sharing tacitly between humans that never goes online. Yeah. So do you believe that this could unlock like, let's say the next level of AI and if so, how are companies looking towards gathering this data that doesn't actually exist on the internet? Yeah, it's a great, a great question. And you all, I mean, I noodle about this stuff all the time. I was thinking about this again, it's kind of surreal, but I was thinking about this on the way to the airport coming here. And because we are reaching this point where most of these models are built on scrapes, data sets that are on the internet, and they're all going to converge at some point because data is what's really driving it. Now, Google's got some unique data sources outside of just what's on the internet that I think will help in the long term, specifically for us. But, you know, outside of that, and I was, as I was driving here, I was thinking about in the, the multimodal data inputs. Like we're so focused on text still too, right? That we as humans, um, and I was just doing this mental exercise on the way here that every second, if I slice that as an image in a multimodal model, we're getting a ton of information, right? And our, our brains are, you may not think you're getting a bunch of training data, but you're probably getting a massive amount of training data. If you look at a time slice of your visual cortex every second is, is, is an image for training. And so I, I think that's, there's, there's definitely some talks on creating synthetic data. Um, there, that's one way. I think the other really interesting and in, uh, area that's come up is, is in simulation. So creating simulated environments and extracting data from those simulated environments. Um, and I think, you know, to your mention, like all the conversations that are going on, um, that's also where I see some startup value too, is that there's probably, and I'm, I'm sure, there's data sets behind closed doors that don't exist on the internet that probably have a lot of intrinsic value to be um, turned into an application or some type of training data. But beyond that, the, the greater, greater picture towards AGI, that's where I, I, I kind of tend to start to think more of, you know, how do you start to introduce new, new modalities into the training set because text is just one portion of it. I always kind of look back at like how we learn as humans and there's a lot of visual information, a lot of audio information um, that goes into that too. So we're just starting to explore those areas of, if you can think of, I mean, I, th I constantly go back to thinking about, and this is just Josh's perspective, please don't quote Google's doing this right now, but I think about YouTube for an example, like what an amazing data set from a visual context perspective that you can map to what's happening in the video where it's a whole new set of training data that, you know, coming from a visual perspective versus text. But it's a great question. It's something we're all thinking about for sure. Thank you. That was a great answer. All right, let's give a round of applause to Josh. Thank you.